Tom Stuart Smith has designed some of the most spectacular gardens in the country. Many imagined first on paper, most integrated to the landscape, and all aimed at bringing out the spirit of the place. There are a number of holy grails, and one of them is about emplacement, making a place feel like a natural coming together of its context. Grand gardens are one thing, but in Wakefield, Tom Stuart Smith has been dealing with a different challenge. How to create a garden for a new art gallery dedicated to the work of sculptor Dame Barbara Hepworth. And to do it on wasteland, hemmed in by a vast Victorian building and a six-lane highway. I was thinking in civic terms rather than garden terms, actually, about the importance of creating almost a sort of semi-defensible space. When you came into it, there would be an exhalation. You would, you would leave the city behind, leave the traffic behind, and you'd be in this cultivated, cultured, looked-after space. I do most of these drawings at home, and I do, I do a lot of them listening to music. Tom Stuart Smith draws. In fact, having been and seen a site, he draws before he does anything else. He cleverly called a book about his many gardens drawn from the land, and so they are, a bird's eye view of how he imagines a space should be developed. It's a technique he's honed over 25 years. He studied art history in Venice in a gap year before starting university, and it seemed natural to use it when he was commissioned to create a garden at a new gallery in Wakefield, West Yorkshire, built to showcase the sculptures of Dame Barbara Hepworth, a building designed by the architect Sir David Chipperfield. The brief was that it should be a garden that people would visit and would visit again and would be a, uh, more than just a sort of adjunct to the, to the gallery, but would be something that would be um, a, a kind of, a, in the best sense of the word, a sort of living asset, which could be a place to show sculpture, but was almost like a sort of an extension of the, of the gallery into the outdoors and would draw people in and would start to create a whole kind of social environment around the gallery. It was really about making a, a richer context for the, for the gallery to thrive in. I want to create a place, I don't want to tell people how to experience that place. And so I hope that when somebody sees a drawing like this, they can almost imagine themselves as being that, that person sitting there and what would the experience of, of that be like? And what would the experience of sort of going through on a particular route? You can, you, there's a sense of sort of imaginative engagement, I hope, with the drawing. In some ways, it's rather like, um, for a client when I do these drawings, it's a bit like the way, the way a Renaissance prince will present a, a, a painting of himself to a prospective wife in another country, um, which says, well, this is, you know, this is what you're going to get. You just hope that when the th real thing turns up, it's not a dreadful disappointment. The garden Tom Stuart Smith was designing would complement David Chipperfield's gallery, even though it would be on the rear facade rather than the front. At the same time, he would be creating a new piece of public realm. 
He had to work with what he was given. There was no question of moving the huge Victorian building running down the side of the plot or the six lanes of traffic at one end. That patch of grass which became the garden was always intended to be developed, um, which would have been a terrible pity. Um, and the, the, the gallery really faces the river and the bridge, which is the principal entrance. And so the back was never really intended to have a much, much of a relationship to, to anything particularly. I think that's, maybe that's a slight overstatement. But it certainly doesn't have a particularly nuanced relationship with the, with the mill building on the other side. They're, they're very, very different buildings. One Victorian red brick, massive, classically proportioned more or less. Quite a handsome brute, but you know, I mean, it is very much a mill building. And then this very, what would you call it? I mean, it's quite a simple, undetailed facade of this slightly purplish concrete done to a very high standard and very much a sculptural form, this sort of slightly scrumpled paper form as, as it's sort of, some people think of it. At one end, a, a, a children's playground. And then at the other end, the, the main road from Wakefield to Doncaster, very noisy, six lane highway not something you really want um, next, to a, next to a garden. All this sat well with Tom Stuart Smith. Those who see him as a designer of grand gardens, like Broughton Grange in Oxfordshire, his first big project with which he's still involved, or this private estate in Yorkshire, both of which will feature later in this programme, forget that he studied landscape design at university and was influenced by Alan Ruff, who promoted the idea of public parks. At graduation, Tom went straight into working on public projects. So, in a sense, at Hepworth Wakefield, he's returning to his roots. I thought it was really important that the space should be, um, can I say, a thing in itself. I mean, something that had its own really strong identity so it was, a, it, was a third, it was a third element in the composition. It didn't attempt to be, as it were, just a sort of parterre or a, or a doormat to the Chipperfield building because the, 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 the listed mill building in some ways was as important a building there. Also, I needed to respond to the brief, which was this had to be an engaging space that people came to, that they, that they sat in, picnicked in, looked at sculpture, spent time in, and came back next week because it was going to be looking different. I felt it had to be closed off to the Doncaster Road. In some ways, this is quite an aggressive statement about creating a precinct. And we did this by, by erecting a large, I mean, a four metre high concrete wall to, to create a kind of garden precinct. And then when that first was put up, that was quite unpopular. And, and there was a bit of resistance to it in the community. But um, without it, there would be really no sense of this garden ha having a, a kind of defined curtilage and I, I am a great believer in the idea that if a garden is going to have almost imaginative power um, and a sense of and a sense of place in the imagination I'm not talking about the, the sort of genius loci sense of place but a sense that when you leave it you know you 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 recapture in your mind the sense of this as a, as a territory it needs to have physical definition Tom Stuart Smith's design reflects Barbara Hepworth's connection with the landscape. Indeed, he was influenced by some of her sculptures on display in the gallery. The role the garden would play in the area was carefully thought through. The Hepworth Wakefield wanted a cultural gardener because they wanted to communicate that my role would not just be caring for planting and vegetation, but also to really nurture the connections between the art gallery and the work that goes on in the gallery as a creative space and the garden outside. I think that both the artwork and the garden are, are really a place for looking and for everyday wonder and that sense of feeling like, wow, look at that, and having a, a spark of joy when you think, oh, that is amazing, and you find something new, a new way to look at something. And by having me here every day, it forges those connections and you have that ongoing conversation with local people about things. But one thing could not have been foreseen, the arrival of a pandemic.
Captured at an early age by the Romantics, entranced by the arts and crafts houses and gardens of Lutyens and Jekyll, taken by his mother to Sissinghurst, and later strongly influenced by garden designer Penelope Hobhouse and the Dutch plantsman Pete Auerdolf, Tom Stuart Smith looks back over nearly 30 years of designing gardens. It was his garden for Chanel at Chelsea in 1998 which gave him a new profile. He would go on to win eight golds over the years. And the commission at Broughton Grange in Oxfordshire two years later, which really set him up. It says something about the way he works, that he still goes back to this garden from time to time, not only to tweak it, but also to think about how his style has evolved. It was a very formative garden for me in that I, I thought a lot about, I thought a lot about the design of it. And then after I made it, I continued to think a lot about the impact it had on me as a thing. And I now look back at it as being, um, I mean, I was 2000, I was 40. You know, most garden designers now have sort of, you know, have a whole career behind them by the time they're 40. I was just sort of starting out, which I suppose says something, doesn't it? You know, I mean, actually, I think garden design is a, is a, is a wonderful career for somebody <laughs> in the mature years, really, because it is such a sort of, it, 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 there's so much cultural accumulation you have to go on. There's so much to learn about, about culture, about plants, about everything. But I think this, I, I look back as being almost a young man's garden. The planting at Broughton Grange he now considers more exuberant than he would use today. But he's still rather pleased with this, his first big project. And, like so many of the gardens that would follow, it's based on his love of the English walled garden, a self-contained world, his fascination with thinking in threes, three areas forming a triptych, and the art of blending the designed garden, the formal garden, and the landscape beyond. What he calls a conversation between the internal and the external, an endless balancing act between content and connection. There are a number of holy grails in my work, and one of them is about emplacement, and making a place feel like a natural coming together of its context. The English, historically, perhaps share something with the, with the Italian tradition of garden making, which is this idea of the hierarchy of, of husbandry, as it were, which starts with a sort of decorated foreground, a sort of managed middle ground, and then the idea of wilderness, and managing that, that journey from the hearth where you live to the, to the heath of, of our imagination, of the, the wild. At Broughton, Tom Stuart Smith developed another part of his design signature, though it has more to do with planting than design, ensuring that these are year-round gardens with life and interest in them, whatever the season. And he experimented with an Islamic influence. I very much saw the water as the empty centre. This is not an anthropocentric garden, it's a sort of nature-centric garden in the broadest sense of the word, and, and rather something of the Islamic tradition, which is something that's interested me for a long time, the idea that, that there is this central process which is happening in the garden at Broughton Grain. In one way, it's, it's a descent into the landscape on three terraces. It's also a descent of water in the landscape and a descent of planting character. 
there was a, an embedded metaphor in it, a patterning of a terrace of a parterre, which represented the cellular structure of the trees and the surrounding landscape. So, so at the point where the garden was at its most abstract, in many ways that it was its most connected to what it was looking around. And, and that, for me, was a, that was quite a potent little point. But to somebody else, they might think, oh, come on, that's just a bit exhausting. So I don't think it's important that somebody knows that. For, for, for somebody looking at it without that bit of boring information, they might just say, well, this is a beautiful pattern of, 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 of box hedges, now sadly replaced by euonymus something or other because it got box blight. But, but um, and, and, and I don't mean to belittle somebody else's interpretation or response to it at all. In some ways, my... The, the genesis of the idea is not important. It gave some coherence to the way I approach the design, but it's not actually necessary to enjoy and have a completely whole experience of the finished work. There was also the idea that a designer might see a garden as a symphony with an overture, a development section, a recurring theme. Tom would use this approach again and again. It could be Wagner or it could be Beethoven. Take your pick. This was a big Beethoven phase for me. I mean, everything's been a Beethoven phase. He's, he's a person to return to for the whole of your life, really. But particularly that sort of early Beethoven, which has this quite classical structure, but has within it this, this extraordinary interplay between violence and lyricism. The classic one, I suppose, is between the Apollonian and the Dionysian, you know, these two different parts of life which are quite difficult to reconcile sometimes, but between something that is, that is more hedonistic and, as it were, flower-loving and loving of, of, of abundance and beauty and everything that nature gives us and then the severe line to which this garden returns in winter. There's that 18th century phrase, isn't there, the, the synthesis of polarities, which is what we're always trying to do, to try and bring these different parts of our life together in one coherent whole. As my career has gone on, I've seen things perhaps less in terms of these sort of clashing <laughs> opposites and slightly more in terms of trying to create a synthetic whole. Tom Stewart-Smith says there are always two gardens, one on the ground and one in your imagination. If trees exist, he'll climb them to see a potential project from above. At the garden he was creating for the Hepworth Wakefield Gallery, he was able to see the plot from upstairs in the gallery itself. What was he thinking about? Perhaps the visit he made to Holland while he was studying at Manchester University. There. He saw the Heme Parks, early examples of public realm maintained by the municipality to be enjoyed by all. The way the Dutch used form, texture and enclosure stayed with him. Tom Stuart Smith would go on to work on what we might call public projects, or at least projects to which the public would be welcomed, such as Trentham in Staffordshire, a huge Victorian garden in the Italian style, which, by the 1990s, had all but collapsed. Now, Trentham has been given a contemporary twist, without losing that bit of theatre the Victorians wanted, and it's open every day, a real community space.
Tom Stuart Smith enjoys being involved in public projects such as the garden alongside Hepworth Wakefield. But it's in the private projects that he's able to achieve the richness we associate with English gardens. Here, in Yorkshire, is Scale, a private garden which includes terraces of three acres, 32,000 perennial plants used in the first season, an opportunity to design two distinct gardens below the 18th century house, a traditional one on the upper terrace, a more contemporary one below. I'm a contextual worker. You, you get the opportunity to work on something approaching a blank canvas, or, or you get the chance, like at the Hepworth, to create such a big intervention that you can, to some extent, pick your language. But I would say that probably half the gardens I've ever done, maybe more, are in the context of important historic buildings, or they're in, in an environment to which I feel my contribution is actually relatively minor. It's like sort of repointing a, a wall with a different type of mortar, or it may be putting a new frieze on, on the basis of something. It's not a whole-scale rebuilding. There is something intensely romantic about this estate, once the site of a priory first recorded in 1017, now occupied by a Palladian house of 1720. Even before Tom Stuart Smith floated up above to draw his bird's eye view, it had all the ingredients a designer looks for. the formality of the areas near the house, the space to add another garden or two in the middle distance, and spectacular views towards the Vale of York. Tom plays down his contributions to a property like this, but any observer can see that his work has shaped the appearance of this historic site, and done so in the most refined way. Not just in the structure and layout of the spaces, but also in the way he uses plants, old-fashioned varieties arranged not in drifts, but in clumps to give a more traditional look. Here is the topiary which he loves and uses frequently. He thinks they echo the shapes of trees in the wider landscape. The box balls, another passion dotted across the space, all part of a rich tapestry. I feel that so much of, our, of, of the context of, of, of our generally sort of historic environment, and where I'm working a lot of the time, has been eroded by a kind of arrogance of people thinking that, taking this sort of generally modernist maxim, that this thing has got to be entirely legible as a different layer. 
Well, I think that's totally laudable and correct, where it really is another layer, you know, which is perceptible throughout. And that's absolutely right. But where it is not a layer, it's, it's, it's just a, a, a minor addition, you know, or a number of minor additions. I think it's pretty important to play the game that you're handed. If you look at my work, you could come out of the other end thinking, well, what is this guy's style? And I don't, I don't mind that as a comment. Working at scale excites Tom Stewart-Smith and he's been lucky to have clients who have the land and the money to make it happen. But there's enjoyment too in operating at different scales. A roof garden in London one moment, that Yorkshire estate the next. And in between, designing a garden at Windsor for the Queen's Diamond Jubilee, reworking the garden at Fort Belvedere where Edward VIII lived until his abdication in 1936 and completing a host of other schemes, big and small. You sense that there are favourites. Here, overlooking the Thames, is a garden which, 15 years after that first big commission at Broughton Grange, shows that Tom was still using the triptych, but also responding to changing tastes in garden design. It has a, a tripartite structure, which is um, interesting, and, and, and water occupying the middle. This part of the garden is a spring garden and has these very sort of curvy organic paths, actually contrasted with straight ones that run through it. And this part of the garden is a summer garden, um, so planted in a very different way. And this is the sort of quiet resolution in between. So, so um, primarily a sculptural composition as opposed to a, a, a sort of a, a flowery one, which is um, kept to the sides. It's possible to dissect a garden like this and see the influences on Tom Stuart Smith's career. Charles Bridgman and William Kent, Nora Lindsay, the fabulous gardens at Ninfa near Rome. And so it goes on. The idea of keeping a garden rooted in its physical and historical context and respecting the work of those who've been here before. This drawing here, which is, which is a, a, a sketch, I and mean, I do make ground level sketches quite often, um, a sketch of the central, that this, this quiet, composed um, central section, shows the setting of, of this pavilion by Jamie Fobert. Actually, we, we ended up twisting it round the other way to this, but it shows the, the, um, uh, the, the way that this is a kind of, res a, the, the quiet resolution, as I call it, the garden. Slightly, slightly noisier things going on either side with flowering trees and flowering plants. Here, mainly grasses and lumps of box. It's an entirely wall garden. And there are views out of it because the land is raised on the other side. And the main thing you see on the other side is this chapel on the hill opposite. My clients were, were very devout Catholics. And that was part of the thinking behind making the garden as a triptych. I mean, in a way, that's just, you know, because there's no figurative element to this at all. But the idea of a triptych is pretty strong in Catholic culture. And there's this quiet contemplative centre where you, where you sit in the pavilion and just look down the canal and it's, there's nothing much to distract you. The garden also can have a narrative which parallels our own life journey narrative from the beginning, from being, from being held 
perhaps in your mother's arms or whatever, to a cultivated middle ground, which is, you know, one's life, which then begins to sort of loosen up and, and, then, is, and then is finally lost. There comes a point where you cannot garden anymore. You know, it is it's somebody else's land or it's, or it's the horizon. And, and that is so much, I think, of the, of the central, central to, the, to, to my philosophy and I think a lot of people's philosophy of gardening. There comes a point where you've just got to say, you know, thus far and no further. And that sense of, 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 of sort of release and letting nature and, and the sort of, you know, the, the cosmic processes take over is, is something which perhaps sets gardeners and landscape architects apart from architects who will want to go on controlling the world forever. <laughs> In Wakefield, West Yorkshire, there was always one question people asked about Tom Stewart Smith's creation as it emerged next to the Hepworth Wakefield Gallery. What was it? Was it a garden or was it a civic space? I was thinking more in, a, in civic terms rather than garden terms actually about the importance of creating almost a sort of semi-defensible space, but one that um, when you came into it, there would be an exhalation. You would, you would leave the city behind, leave the traffic behind, and you'd be in this cultivated, cultured, looked after space. And so the fact that it was a very actively garden space for me was also important. The Hepworth had this idea of, of calling the gardener, the cultural gardener. Well, some people thought, oh, how pretentious is that? but it absolutely describes the role of, of this person, which was to create a cultivated space, both in the sense of it being physically cultivated and looked after so that, so that residents and people who came to the, the gallery quite often, you know, ah, oh, you're here again, you're looking after this place. How extraordinary. People don't look after places in, in, in Wakefield as a rule, you know, or anywhere. I mean, when, when have you ever walked into a public space in Britain in the last 25 years and said, oh, I've seen that person looking after this before. It just doesn't happen. And that's a terrible tragedy. The other aspect of the, of the cultural space was that it was something for the community to come together. It's like another arm of the, of, of the gallery, sort of inviting people in, a sort of rather sort of soft welcoming arm, you know, saying, OK, you may find Barbara Hepworth sculpture a bit much, but, you know, how about this? Let's start, start at an easy end. Let's start with a purple salvia, and then, then we'll, you know, then we'll get you onto the British modernist sculpture sort of a bit down the line. And I think in that way, it probably is going to be extraordinarily effective at, at bringing more people into the gallery. Soon after Tom Stuart Smith completed the garden at Hepworth Wakefield came the pandemic and suddenly his creation was seen in a different light, a place where the residents of Wakefield could come during lockdown, a place to meet while having to be socially distanced. Here was the connection between people and place and plants that all designers aim for, realised because of the most unexpected turn of events. And if the scheme proved its worth, so did the appointment of that cultural gardener who would be there day in and day out, a familiar face in frightening times. Quite amazing for me to be here every day during the pandemic because the gallery had to close its doors, of course, necessarily. I felt quite a responsibility to represent the gallery. And actually, I got to know a lot of people because some people came every single day and people, some people just, you know, you just, it's, sometimes it's just a nod of the head and it's like, hey, are you all right? How are you doing? And other times people are telling you 
a deep problem that they've gone through and you think you're thinking yeah this is so much on your mind that you that you're sharing it with with me here on the street but but surely that's what that's what this garden is for it's a place for being social as much as it is a place for plants and a physical space to look at Tom Stewart Smith had always wanted an organic layout for Hepworth, such as you would find in an old city, what he calls awkward, unaligned naturalism. Now, during a crisis no one foresaw, his design at Hepworth came into its own. Tom Stewart Smith's design for the garden here has got year-round interest and he thought very hard about how you build in that seasonal appeal, so it changes quite quickly the colours and the textures and the different insects and creatures that you can see. And actually that detail is really important because that enables people to zoom in and look at something and think, hang on, that was different, or, or the colour palette has shifted across the whole thing. And it gives you a reason to come back regularly, it gives you that point of connection, and it gives you that attachment to that memory because you think, oh, I came with my friend in March and it was cold and we looked at the daffodils and now we come and it feels like we're in a wild meadow and it's all pink and blousy and completely different. That change and that detail, I think, is critical to local people's um, sense of connection with it. It's vital, I think. It, it builds a sense of community and it builds a sense of connection that we are part of the natural world and and in looking and enjoying it, you feel a bit of peace and um, a part of something, something lovely, something heartening, something good. For Tom Stewart Smith, it's been a life of what he calls archetypes. On the one hand, great private gardens in the English manner, where the clients are wealthy enough not only to enhance what they have, but also to create a new and to pay for a staff of gardeners to keep it looking spectacular. On the other, gardens which can be enjoyed by everyone, spaces which nod to the city parks of our ancestors and the Dutch parks, which made such an impact on a young student 30 years ago. And what now? After so many years of drawing designs, Tom Stewart Smith is doing something remarkable. He's taken on a couple of projects which are more about planting than design, that will emerge organically, literally, and reflect the current trends in garden design, which is to be more naturalistic. In Spain, in Ribera del Duero, a winemaker asked him to invent a garden around a new visitor center. For the very first time, Tom did not draw a bird's eye view. I'm really attracted to working places which, have, which bring a lot of their own cultural baggage to the table so that you, you, you know you cannot carry on as normal because it would just be a preposterous thing to do. You, you've got to understand a bit of, of, the, of the cultural language of the place you're in and that makes the, that makes the, 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 the product which will then be a, 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 a sort of cross fertilization of cultures, a much richer thing, rather than if you just go in and say, I'm going to give you an English garden, and you're going to just shut up and wait, <laughs> wait for it to arrive. The best work is always going to be where there's something which makes you think, oh gosh, I don't really know how to do this, and makes you go back and think again a little bit about your whole modus operandi. And when we talk about the way he works, there is one other point that may have been bothering you. The fact that all Tom Stewart Smith's wonderfully detailed drawings, all those bird's eye views, are in black and white, which is not an accident. Particularly English, we're very distracted by plants very easily. It's very easy if you're working for somebody to start playing. Where I'm going to put my, to start saying where am I going to put my dahlias, or you know what what colours you can do. And I want to slow down the conversation a bit and consider questions of sequence and form and spatial character and just get somebody used to the idea of this garden as a place and a space. Tom Stuart Smith's collection of drawings, so central to his career and worth an exhibition in their own right, include an aerial view of his home in Hertfordshire, the place where he grew up and where he planted trees with his father, and to which he's just moved his practice. He's given up a London office prompted in part by the pandemic, which, he thinks, 
has changed people's attitude to the countryside and to nature, and in part, perhaps, by a desire to pause and look back over a quarter century of garden design and drawing. I remember my, my brother told me once when I was trying to write something about what I did, um, and I was being too referential to various sources. He said, oh, don't worry about all that, just be a magpie. And I think that's a very good, particularly in our, in my world, being acute to things, and they're normally cultural things, actually, because finally making gardens is a, is a cultural endeavour. It's about, it's about making a richer tapestry for us to enjoy and for us to live in. Next time, in another life, Tanya Compton lived in Ibiza. Footloose and fancy free, in her early 20s, she didn't go to the Balearics to look at gardens. But strangely, it was Ibiza which converted her from clubbing to cuttings, as she puts it, and that started her career as a writer and eventually a garden designer. I have unwittingly changed a lot of people's engagement with nature, and I, I suppose that's more than I could have hoped for. The influence of Ibiza's wild flowers can be seen in Tanya Compton's Wiltshire home. But a few miles away, she's been working on a grand formal garden where others have trod the land before her and whose foundations have shaped her plans. I knew that I had to do something that would work with the unbelievable Detmar Blow architecture that remained from this enormous house 